Okay, I am here, and and sorry about that. I'm trying to do something new, which always you know works out. Um, <laughs> which is I'm also live on Instagram today, so I don't even know if that's working or not. But uh, here we are. Thank you very much, Paul and Martin, for coming on. Um, and and thanks everybody else for coming on. Maybe in the replay that you're seeing. Um, I need to turn off a little banner here. This is the first time doing this, so I'm a little you know I'm always scattered but today even a little bit more. So welcome and thank you very much for coming at How to Diorama. Uh, I am Bill and today we're just gonna talk about diorama stuff. Um, mostly about the current diorama that I'm working on, which is my World War I trench diorama. And uh, I'll, I'll show pictures of that and the progress and all that kind of stuff. But it's also, I think, really important to get questions. I, I love answering questions. I love to interact with folks. And um, any time during it, please ask a question if you have one. Um, there is a bit of a delay just for latency reasons. And so if I don't get exactly your question, I'll, I'll, I'll just try to get to it as soon as I can. And, and I may need clarification sometime. So anyway, there we go. And, and I'm a little goofy. So sorry, I just had to throw that out there. Uh, so I got some folks uh, saying hello. Uh, and first class is here. Hello. Thanks very much for coming on. Uh, Scott is here. Hello. Thanks very much for coming on, Scott. Really nice to see you. Um, and you know, uh, blue is, is first last. Um, I got your pictures, uh, on, uh, on discord and great stuff. You know, I also have a patron and on the patron, it also allows access to Discord, and lots of folks can work, throw in like work in progress photos. Uh, Martin was saying earlier, you know, he's working on ATST and um, had a little bit of an issue this last week. So I'd love to hear more about that. Um, did the did the enamel wash just eat it? Did it did it? Did it break down some of the glues or something? I'd love to hear about this, Martin. What, you know what happened with the enamel wash, um, but yeah. So you can you can upload stuff, and I also like to get uh, viewer mail. No, I don't have any this week, but I, I had you know other weeks. Um, so if you have a project that you're working on, you can email it to me. You can send it to me uh, like on Patreon if you're one of my patrons, stuff like that, and then I'll, I'll try to get it up there. I think it's really fun to look at uh, other folks stuff and, and then to show your things during the live stream. I think it's a lot of fun. So thanks very much for everybody. I want to say hello to everybody. There's Scott. Hello, Scott. Uh, there's John Robeck. Hey, John, how's it going? Um, and Martin says, yes, it breaks down Bandai plastic if it's unprotected and under stress. Wow. No kidding. So yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to look further at that because if it's physically breaking the plastic down, that's a big deal. If it's separating the plastic from the adhesive, that's something else. I, yeah, it's very interesting. I, I'd, I'd like to look into that. Really, really cool, Martin. Um, what's your email? Hint, hint. Hey, there's a good point. Thanks very much, John. John is like a friend and and also helps me out a lot with stuff that I totally like over my head. So the email is bill at scalemodelcraft.com. And that's it. That's my email. And so you can send me stuff and you can send me, um, you know, a picture. When you're sending pictures, try to get it to the, to the ones you really want to show. Typically when I ask this, I'll get 14 emails with like 30 pictures and I can't show them all. Unfortunately, I, I really like looking at them, but I can't show them all. So if you could um, send just your favorites and give me a little write-up. I love to read your story about your images on the on the live stream. So that would be really fun. And I really like looking at your stuff. It is it is a show and tell. It is not me giving advice or anything like that. If you want me to, I typically do that offline. I don't like giving advice about stuff online. I have, and it's it's awkward. You know, it's like, well, I was thinking something completely different. So anyway, yeah, that that could help. Um, so thank you very much. And I appreciate it, John. Uh, Mark is here. Hello, Mark. Did you get my email? I, Mark had emailed me like in December, uh, right before my vacation. And I didn't get back to you, Mark. I am so sorry, sir. Uh, but I did get back to you this week. And so I hope you got that. It was really fun. And I'm looking forward to your diorama projects. It's really cool. 
Um, hey, Josh is here. Wow, Josh. I don't get to see you very often on the on the live stream. That's really, really cool. Thank you very much for coming in. Josh is an amazing modeler. And today we are also going to talk about something that he's very intimately uh, involved with, which is the Northwest Scale Modelers Model Mania show coming up next month. And so I'm going to do a little hype on that because it's my favorite show. It honestly is. And um, I, I really enjoy it. It's a non-competition show. Josh is involved in helping the planning and doing some presentations and doing some like a, a special presentation on Gunpla uh, and, 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 you know, different Mecca and things like that. Sorry, Josh, I know I'm going to just ham this thing all up, but um, it's really great that you're on. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about that show. It's a really, really fun show. So, uh, yeah, well, work is keeping me busy, but wanted to pop in and say hi. That's awesome, Josh. Thanks very much. See, and I can send virtual thumbs up too, because it's weird. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at, at, at what we're looking at today, because I had a really interesting week. Number one, um, Oscar tried to kill me. Um, he, he's, you know, he's 19 and he is, uh, having fits sometimes and he bit me. And so, and, and so it was a, it was a fight to first blood and he won. Um, but he's okay. You know, he had just a little bit of a fit and, and he latched onto my hand and, and tried to get some shots, not shots, but you know, stuff to take care of it. Um, I also got an invite to do, um, it's a repair of a, uh, something that's going on display at the museum of flight in Seattle. And I'm super excited about it. It's a model of the Mir space station as it's attached to the, um, the shuttle Atlantis. And it was a presentation model to astronaut Frank Culbertson. And so it's going on display later this year and um, it needed some repair. It, some of the things had broken off of it and stuff like that. So I got asked to do that and I totally volunteered and I'm really excited about it. And so, yeah, that's really fun. So I'll just show you a picture right at the end. I just thought that was really fun and, and wanted to mention it. Um, and again, Oscar is great. He's sleeping right here next to us. So he's doing just fine. So, um, so let's look, look at some slides here. Hey, Paul is here. Hello. Um, uh, we talked to Josh, uh, Paul is here. Hello, uh, Paul. Thanks very much for, for coming in. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, got it. Uh, Paul, there we go. I was trying to get, hello, Paul. I was trying to get everybody, you know, to say hi. Um, okay. So I would love to show you some slides. Uh, so I'm going to try to do this and not make it like, uh, let me see if I can change this because is that working? No, it's not. So <laughs> um, I, I, I chose trenches and Tommies because I've, I've been working on the top trenches of my World War I trench diorama, you know, over the past, my goodness, almost a year. It started um, the first of, or I think the first of July um, uh, last year. And, and so we're at like the sixth month and, and it's, it's really doing well. Um, it's about the Livens Lodge Gallery flame projector. And so that is on the bottom of it. But here's what I really need to talk about. Now, I tried to do something here fun and it didn't work. And so now you can't really see this very well, but uh, I've got another slide later on. This is the 2024 Model Mania show. And the, the cool thing about this is it is a non-competition show. Being non-competition means you can bring stuff that you're not trying to win. And when you go to a competition show, a lot of times you're just bringing like your best stuff. Well, this is really fun because people can bring sometimes their entire collection of models. And that's encouraged because it allows you to see somebody's evolution of their models. Um, I know some folks have had eight tables, you know, the large display tables, eight full of their models. Um, so I don't know if that is going to happen this year, but, um, the, the point is you can see somebody's, the, the, the depth of the work that they've done in their modeling or dioramas or whatever. And it's a really great show. It's one of the largest model count shows. It's lots of foot traffic. It is family friendly. Um, and I think it's just a wonderful time because there's no competition the models stay on the floor until the end. It's also two days. You know, I've been to some shows and sometimes if you're going as a, 
to, to just look and, and, and observe and you want to see the models, you get there uh, and some of the models are gone. Well, <clears throat> the reason is after modeling or the, the judging, some folks are like, I got to get out of here. You know, they want to beat the rush or something like that. And so you get there and there's not a lot of models. The models are there for two days. There's full tables. There's going to be a lot of people coming in from uh, out of town. There's some great stuff. And let's go back to the slide that, that talks about this a little bit better. Um, and I'll have this slide available and links available after the, the live stream. Um, it's a wonderful show. Um, it is at the Museum of Flight. The venue is outstanding. And um, if, you, if you're in the Seattle area, or if you can make it literally to the Seattle area, I think it's really worth the, the, the travel. Um, okay. Uh, Paul says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, our cat has gone a bit strange this week. Uh, stays out normally, but this week has not been more than four feet away from me for, or the wife. Isn't that weird, Paul? You know, I'm I'm totally a cat person. Our, our whole family is. And um, you notice when they're different. Now, in, in Oscar's case, it's because he's, you know, he's getting old and, and, and some stuff is just not working right, you know, up there. And so he kind of had a little fit. Um, but he's okay. Like I said, he's okay. But yeah, sometimes that can happen. Uh, uh, when they get a little older or they just are weird during a separate week. Hey, Neil is here. Hello, Neil. Thank you very much for coming in. You know, Neil does the one six scale, uh, world war two and world war one dioramas. They're amazing. If you haven't seen Neil's work, look up Neil Bullard and you'll find him on Facebook. Amazing stuff. Absolutely amazing stuff. Thanks very much for coming in, Neil. Great to see you. Mark says, I got your email, but life has gotten very much in the way. I get it, sir. No worries. Um, you know, just you take your time. It took me a long time to get back to you. So when, when the opportunity strikes. Okay. So, um, this week I worked a lot on the trenches, the tops of this. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I, I see your, your, uh, little emoji thing there. I hope stuff's going okay, Mark. Um, maybe afterwards, you know, if you want to call or something like that, uh, be fine to talk, you know, I uh, hope you're doing okay. Um, and, uh, Josh says there will be an updated flyer soon. So I will give the link where people can access that Josh. And thank you very much. I really appreciate it because there's going to be some really neat shows. Um, uh, I just got the email this morning about my presentation. I'll be there of course, and, and I'll be doing a presentation, not a hundred percent sure what I'm going to do yet, but it's going to be on dioramas. You can bet. So it'll be a lot of fun. And if, uh, excuse me. If you do watch the show and you do possibly come down and, and we have a chance to meet, please tell me who you are. Because a lot of times, you know, your avatar or your name online is different. And 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 I don't make the connection. You know, a lot of folks are online, wonderful friends. I love them very much. But I don't know what they look like. So if you do stop by, really would love to say hi and, um, and, and, and you know, who you are. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so let's get back to this because I think some of this is pretty fun. So we're working on the, the top of this. I have been working for months since July, of course, to get the subterranean elements of this built. And <clears throat> pardon me, as I'm doing that, I'm trying to figure out what the story is here. Now it's based on the Livens large gallery flame projector, which is all fine and well, but there's gotta be alternate stories. So this is where I'm starting to try to build those stories in with what is is happening in the diorama this is what i use for uh a a willow holdback and a willow holdback was used in the trenches it was weaved out of willow and they were actually manufactured so they were standardized and and so they would put these up they would they would attach the walls and help the the dirt from from falling in well what i use is um pine needles so when I, I first went to make these things, I, I didn't want to use what I'd seen some other folks use. It didn't maybe look natural. Well, these long pine needles seem to do the trick for me. And, and here's the, the basic process that I use to build them. And I've done this in a, a demonstration and, and a video and stuff, but these are these long, they're awfully long pine needles. And um, we just got them off the ground. Uh, if you got them green, if you're able to find them, they're green, um, then it might be easier to work with. But the ones that I got 
were on the ground. They come in little, each one is like a three um, uh, pine needle bundle. And to work with it, if I just tried to use this right now, number one, it's a little dirty. Um, <clears throat> number two, it's a little bit brittle. So what I do is I take just a large, and it has to be tall because I don't want to stuff them into something. I guess, it, you know, if you had a tub, you can do it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in here and then I pour boiling water, boiling water right in there. The, the little teapot that I have doesn't fill this. So I, I take boiling water up to about there and then, and then I put off some water there. I let that soak for about 20 minutes. And then I've got a little jig. And the little jig is very, very simple. It's just a, a piece of wood. And I've drilled one eighth inch holes in it, a half an inch apart in a straight line. And I, gosh, I don't know how many I got there. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 11. Why do I have 11? I don't know. That's what could fit. And I'll take those and, you know, fill in the rest of the toothpicks. And I can weave those after they've soaked in the water. And so when I've weaved them after they've been weaved, then I'll take a little bit of tape, kind of tape up the ends. And then I pull that out of the jig and then I douse it with Mod Podge. Now, now what the Mod Podge does is it cements everything together. All of that stuff is now going to stick to those, those toothpicks. And then I can bring them, or, or once it dries, the Mod Podge is completely clear and it's flat, so you're not going to see it. Then I can bring it to the model and then I had to trim it. So let's take a look at that. So here... Um, this is the top of the model that I'm working with that. There are those holdbacks, those willow holdbacks that I've put in there. They're supposed to be looking rough. They're supposed to be a little bit of stuff coming through them, but I think they look pretty good. It, the, the other thing that I like about it is it's a natural, uh, uh, a natural material. Uh, I was going to say fiber, but it's a natural material. Now, what I need the holdbacks for, I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting a good picture of this. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to simulate that that, you see the dip in the top there, that is supposed to be an artillery splash mark. And then here it is pushing those willows in, those, those other uh, pieces of wood are shoring. I had to uh, kind of, this is the piece that I made with the, uh, the um, clothespins holding it in. And then I put mud behind it and then formed it on the wall and gave me, you know, a nice cave in. Now, here are pictures and I've got some live shots of this I'm going to show you. I, I want to show you this now because what I'm trying to do here is on this cave in, this is part of the story, right? I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to weave this story together on this entire diorama because story is so important. The story allows people that are looking at it to kind of recognize something or see a, a, a specific uh, series of events that, that start to tell a story. And if they can pick that up just visually, that's pretty cool. You know, they can they can see, hey, this happened. And, and, and these guys see what they're doing over here. They're doing that because this happened. You know, that's that's a neat thing to be able to try to portray. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So uh, I'm going to show you now a top down shot. If I can figure out which camera. Hey, look at that. I figured it out. This is the um, forward trench that is on the diorama. This point right here that I'm pointing at is directly across from the cave-in. So that cave-in, that little where the, basically the bulge of the top of the trench is coming in, that's directly across from this little point coming out. And, and of course... The World War I trenches were zigzag to try to keep concussion from moving down the, the trench. So that's, you know, if you're not aware of that. I Originally, I didn't know that. So that's the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that. I, I didn't know. Um, so back to the picture. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to show that what they were interested in is repairing that cave-in um, and, and the best way to do it was from below, of course, cause you're, you have the safety of the, of the, uh, trench, but above they needed to get above to do some of the shoring. 
And to get above, they had to give themselves cover. So now what I'm, I'm trying to do here is I'm showing you this. This is cover. Cover meaning something to hide behind. Um, when you're in a in a like a combat situation, stuff like that, I, I know because I've not been in combat, I've just gone through training. I was in the military in the Cold War infantry. So cover is something that you want to find on a battlefield so you can hide behind it, you know, get your bearings, understand where you're on, and then make your, your next move. Well, in this instance, what they're doing is they're setting up some cover, and it doesn't have to be very heavy cover because they're going to do this work at night. So they just need places along the top of the trench to basically, they're, they're low crawling, bringing materials that they're going to be using to shore up this cave in. They're bringing them along the top of the trench. The top of the trench that's, by the way, behind their trench, so it's behind the enemy trenches of the other side. This is the, the friendly or the allied side of the trench. And they're bringing materials up. And, and I think, number one, it looks cool. It adds interest. But the whole point is, can I make it look like, um, without any explanation, that it's adding to that story? Are people going to be able to see that this imagery that I'm, I'm, I'm putting together here with all of this, this detail, is it going to look like what I'm trying to explain? <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining it well or not. But is that going to give that impression? That's what I'm trying to do. And I think that's a really fun thing. That's a fun thing about building dioramas. You know, I'm trying to tell a story and I've done it before where I was able to put like little placards that, that outline the story, that give certain um, elements of the story and tell you the story. And that coincides with the imagery. But I've always liked the idea of walking up to something and trying to figure it out. And if somebody can, and hope, that's what I'm trying to do again, if somebody can make it look uh, good enough that you can follow the story without any prompting, personally, I think that's a goal for me. I want it to be, I don't know, I don't want it to be cartoonish, but I want it to be realistic enough that you can just look at it and follow the story. So, that's what I'm trying to do. And I think a, a, a big part of that, and I got to turn this camera back on. Sorry. It goes a little wild after a bit. Um, if I can, if I can do that with this trench part, I think that just goes along with the story. Now that's not the whole story. That's just one element of what's going on in the diorama. So how does that relate to it? Well, it doesn't really relate to anything. It's just a side story that's happening while the other things are going on underground. Uh, but I think it, it adds interest. It, it draws people in. And that's the whole purpose, it, at least the way I think about it, in doing a diorama is you want to tell a story so you can draw people in. Uh, you're entertaining. You're informing. You're, you're trying to communicate an idea. Use that term a lot. Um, and, and this is just one way to accomplish it. Okay. So I'm going to go back to some slides real quickly. And this is just some, again, maybe a little bit easier to see than the live shot, the, the, the bird's eye view. You can see that I've put in some corrugated tin there. That still needs to be a little bit of paint. And I still need to match the paint on top of these uh, with, you know, you see the, 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 the trench that's close to us, the, the top of the trench is close to us. It's a little bit more yellow. The one furthest away is a little bit more brownish. Um, I know it's hard to see in this, it, which is a shame because you can really see it nicely, um, you know, when you're standing next to it. I was trying to capture that uh, because the depth, it's just real flat here. But um, yeah, I, I, I really like the top of this because again, you're adding that interest. Okay, so that is what they both look like uh, opposite themselves. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is this. And why didn't I flip that? I don't know. Jiminy Christmas. This is the vehicle that I have not shown in forever. So that's the other thing. Do you remember that this, well, maybe some people have never seen, but this vehicle is where it all started. This is the Copper State Models um, 135th scale uh, Lancaster or Lanchester. I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but this is the the car and it's a really nice kit i built it right at the beginning when i was just trying to get you know the 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 idea of the size and and, and the spatial you know what this this diorama is going to look like 
but it's now time to go back and do this. It was built up um, to the point of primer. That's where I typically stop. Then I'll build the diorama and then I'll come back. And now I need to match this to the diorama. So that's coming up this next week. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about it. You know, it's a fun looking vehicle. Uh, what they did at the early parts of World War One is this was not a purpose built armored vehicle. They literally took the chassis of an existing vehicle and they put an armor um, coach. I mean, because it was the coach works that did, you know, the body, but they just put an armored body on it. That's that's basically the, the only thing. I believe there was some obviously some changes as they went along, but early in the war, this is what they had. Um, I'm utilizing this one to kind of demonstrate um, the the delivery or the pickup of something from the the trenches, and so um, that was something that uh, I wanted to incorporate, it, like a tank or something in there, you know, instead of just people. And um, I really like the vehicle. Now I've got some nice um, older articles that a friend gave me about painting. Uh, and, and so I'm super excited about that. I also spoke earlier, I think last week or yeah, I think it was last week about a book that I recently got, um, by Mike Butler model painting world war one allied figures. And I can't do a review on this cause I haven't read it, but I can tell you, um, I really like it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go further, because we're going to start talking about figures. Okay, I want to make sure I've got everybody's... Uh, John says, I wonder if the tires were solid, air wouldn't seem to last long. You know, and, and that might have been one of those things that they figured out later on, because I've also got uh, like a truck, a lorry. I'm not sure what the, well, it's an American, so it's a truck. Um, and heck, it had steel wheels. You know, I mean, these things were were early on. Uh, I remember my father uh, telling me about my grandfather, who was uh, born in 1900. Um, he would drive the no suspension uh, logging trucks, and they had steel wheels. Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty crazy stuff. Um, trying to go down a hill and you hit the brakes and you have steel wheels. You just keep going. But yeah, uh, crazy stuff back then. So I don't know if they had like solid pneumatic rubber or solid rubber tires, um, tubeless, you may say. Uh, that would make sense. I don't know. But good question, John. Um, I, I, obviously, I have to look that up now. But um, we're going to look at figures. Now, figures are something that I've done a lot of. There's a ton of figures in this thing. And I think at one point I estimated there's going to be 30 or so figures in this. I haven't counted lately, but there's a bunch in there. And what I started working on this week is um, like three different areas of, of where I'm going to have them. I've got some folks that I'm working on that are going to be in the trenches. Uh, three figures that I have there. I've got three figures that are going to be in the lift house or the lift area uh, above the vertical shaft in the diorama. And then I've got three German figures that are going to be in a new area that I put in when I built the, um, when I built the display stand. So in the bottom of the display stand, of course, I've got that area and I'll show a picture of that. So I can, you know, give reference to all this, but we're going to talk about how I modify them first and how I, I do the heads. Um, I've shown that before. I've talked about it a couple of times. I've done live streams specifically on how to do heads, um, but I've had a lot of comments on it. So if you've seen this and, and you're not really interested in it, I'm sorry. I hope I can add some more to it because it, it is a really nice thing. And I think that I'm getting a little bit better at it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my progress. It's something that you can, you know, um, practice up and, and, and get a little bit better. So these are the two figures that I put heads on. And, and what I mean by heads is, you know, we've all gotten these figures before where in the kit they're designed, and I've got pictures, but they're designed to have a hat. So they've got a flat head. They don't have the top of their head. Well, all I do 
is I put a piece of styrene on there and then I shape it down and I carve it. And then I'm, I'm able to, um, you know, make a, a head and hair. So here's part the way through uh, trying to shape that, that top of the skull. Um, and I think something that's really important, it is important to let this thing dry, I think overnight, maybe all day if you do it in the morning and then you can carve at night. I've tried doing it because I'm using Tamiya glue, a cement, you know, to glue the styrene to the top of the head. I have tried to carve it when it's only been a few hours and it's sliding around, it's moving on you. Just let it get solid because when you start doing the techniques I'm going to show you here, it does want to shift. You're getting in there and you're, you know, the way you have to work it, um, you want that thing solid. So let it dry overnight. Um, then once I've got it dried overnight, I'm, I'm hoping that comes through. I've got other shots here. Um, then you start like carving and, and, and sculpting to just make the white styrene uh, you know, conform number one to the head and then to give it this little, this little hairdo. And, um, you see, you want to carry it through. This is the part where I'm trying to take the hair, the little cuts that I'm scribing in the head here. Um, um, going from the white styrene to the original model, I want to carry that all the way through and then it just blends it in. So here's how we do it. Uh, and I've got a couple of questions here. So let me a uh, answer that. Uh, uh, Cole, hello, Cole. Nice to see you. Hi, hope you are doing great and having a great life. Thank you. We certainly are. I hope you are too, Cole. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, so what I want to show you back here is um, this is how I carve it. The image on the left, this is the top of the head that I've shaped generally, uh, after it's just generally shaped like a head, then what I'll do is I will cut, starting at the, the rear or crown of the head, I'm gonna see if I can get me in there so you can see me talking. So I'm starting back here at the crown of the head, and then I go forward to uh, the top of the forehead. Then when I get to the top of that forehead, then I make a Y, I go to the left and I go to the right. And then I come up and cut a little divot. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures of, of what I mean by a divot. Um, it's basically, let me go forward and find this. This is a much better picture. I think this is going to show it. When I'm carving this, you see underneath the the part where the hair is coming down from the left hand side to the right that's what i mean like a little divot you want to cut that line kind of sharp so you've started the crown of the head you go forward and then you you start with the forehead once i've got the forehead started then i can come back and see here's a different forehead uh, I, this guy i think looks like peyton manning so i'm calling him peyton manning um I just went a little bit higher with the forehead and I put a little wave on the front of the hair there and I've got a completely different hairdo, which is kind of nice, you know, because you, you can really see this later on and you see his hair comes back a little bit. Um, and then you see how the hair comes down. This is after it's been primed, of course. There's the other guy. And... So once you start getting, and I've just started throwing paint on these, they're not even started. The hair is green for crime any sakes, but you can really see uh, the difference, the stark difference of how it looks. So I'm going to go back and I want to show you the, the tool that I use to do this. Okay. So this is, um, whoops, let me do this. This is the tool that I use to do the scribing. And um, when I bought it, it was in a Tamiya uh, box or, or, you know, whatever. Um, but when I look at it, it says Master Tools 9928. Uh, now, I just got this at Hobby Town. Um, and, but it's a great tool. It's pretty small, too. So the, the great part about it is you see that that's the carving tip. So what they've done on this is they've they've squared the end of it and then they've come at an extreme angle from one of those corners to the other. 
So this works really nice to get a V cut in the top of the heads as I'm trying to sculpt that hair. So let's go look at that hair again. I'm going to kind of back, uh, go forward, I think, here, actually. So you can see there with the hair, um, all I'm doing there, and I'm going to go back to the drawing. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around through these. But this drawing shows on the right-hand side that when I'm doing the hair, I start at that part that I created that comes from the rear uh, uh, crown of the head, near the rear of the head, and I went forward. Well, then I start on each side and I do these lines. Now, I don't want to scribe a line all the way down. I've done one there. That's fine. But you want to do shorter lines. It just looks a little bit more natural. And, and I think it gives you the ability to get different paint in there. Because when you paint these two, you're not just going to paint it brown you know, or black or whatever. You're going to do shades just like you're shading uh, a uniform, just like you're shading the face when you're painting the face. You're going to shade the hair too. Um, and, and pay particular close attention if you've got older folks that you're doing, sometimes silvering you know, right here, or even in the hair. Looks really good. So that, uh, and I'm going to go back to the picture. That is how I'm doing this. Um, the, the, you see where I have deeper and then shallow. So what I'm saying there is, and, and I, I kind of have to go back to me to, to be kind of visual. So here's the hairline, right? And so if my part, I've got a part on the other side, but so if the part were there, I want to cut in underneath the hair here, not underneath, but up to a little bit more uh, deep here and then just let it tail off as it goes here, you know, as the as the hair comes around. So a little bit deeper up here, just to, to pretty much nothing down here. That's how I'm carving the head and that's how I get that nice look of the hair kind of going in there. Um, it's really not that hard uh, to do. Obviously, I've done a few of these now, so you do got to practice just like everything. But if you kind of follow, you know, this, that's what I've done every single time. And I'm getting a little bit better. You kind of see where the hair goes. You see there at the back at the crown as you as you start working the hair back, you're kind of coming off of that part at a little bit different angle and just walk your way around. The hair falls naturally uh, as you're scribing it. And when you're scribing it with this, um, you're not going too deep. Um, I, uh, I have like a, a Tormek sharpener for, for like my woodworking tools and things like that. But um, this thing is pretty darn sharp. So as you're going in, you're kind of following around the arc of the head and it'll go so far and then stop. Don't let it worry you. Again, doing short, kind of curved uh, uh, scribes in the head makes it look really nice. Uh, practice with it. A little deeper, a little bit shallower with these. It works great. And this tool works wonderfully. Um, I have tried to do it with other tools. Um, it's just the V shape of this that really helps create that hair. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, I'd love to talk more about it. Um, I probably have to do a very detailed video of it in the future. Um, I already kind of told myself I would, uh, cause I've shown it on the live streams before, but I, I think a, a, a nice video showing that really tight is helpful because it just gives you the option. You know, when I'm looking at these guys, it just gives me another option for this figure, which is the greatest part of it, right? I've got the ability now to take these guys, which had a hat on be it a helmet or like head cover, whatever. And I can now pose them indoors or in different situations where it would just be a little bit more appropriate to have them have hair and not, uh, and not a hat. So I like it because it, it gives me another option. Okay. So these are just the other figures I'm working on. This is a British soldier climbing out of the trench. Um, this is one of the soldiers that um, I modified because you can modify these. You don't always have to put the legs where they say put the legs. You don't have to put the arms where they say put the arms. I, I've done a, a live stream on this. What I do is I'll just I'll strip everything off the deal 
off of the sprue, you know, um, and then I start assembling the way that I want to assemble them. Some kits are a little bit better at that. Other kits will sometimes mold their pieces so you can't interchange them. That's okay. Uh, Tamiya allows you to do it where you can just interchange them. I think ICM as well. Um, I do Masterbox, ICM, and Tamiya figures quite a bit uh, and, and love them, all three. Okay, let's see what we got next here. This guy is, um, I'm having problems with him. I got to put a head on him, but he is going to be a sick guy uh, laying down. You're only going to see him from the back. Uh, this guy is a World War I soldier that, I'm sorry, a World War II soldier that I'm going to make into a World War I soldier. Now, I did a live stream on that too. Um, there are differences in the uniform, certainly. But the big, the upper uniform, like the jacket, but the biggest different th difference that I identified and worked with was the fact that the pants and the jacket in the World War I and the World War II, um, they didn't have putties in World War II. They had kind of bloused uh, pants that went all the way down. And the jacket went below the waistline in World War I. If we go back to the picture, this guy, the jacket pretty much stops below the waistline, right below the, the pistol belt there. And then you see the pants have this big pocket there and, and there's no jacket that comes down and there's no putties. So I'm going to modify this like I've done the other guys and, and we'll, I'll, I'll give him putties and stuff like that. Cause you can modify these. That's the other thing that I've really enjoyed here over the last year, two, maybe year and a half, um, modifying figures. I figured out that I could modify them pretty easily. And it, it really came down to looking at other figures that look like what I wanted this one to look like, maybe in a different pose, but a different kit or something like that. Um, like I had a kit with uh, that had shorts on, right? The, the Anzacs had shorts on. Well, I had another Anzac kit and they weren't wearing shorts. So I was able to cut the pants off and give them shorts just by carving the pants back. That was the very first mods that, that, that I did. I've now since gone on and done much, you know, quite a bit more modifications like the heads and, and things like that. And it's just kind of opened it up because uh, I can, I can now take those figures that had basically one pose when I bought it in the kit and I have multiple poses out of it. I have multiple, I can buy two or three of the same exact kit and have every one of them look different, which is wonderful. Now the faces, I'm not there yet. I got to work on the faces, but just by doing some simple modifications, which, which really don't take long and are not hard, um, gives you more options with these figures. Um, I guess my end goal is to build scratch figures uh, down the road. So that's kind of where I want to get, but that maybe is down the road a long ways. But just modifying these figures now is just so cool that I, I want other folks to know how to do it. Okay, so uh, where we be? That guy is going to be modified. This is really fun. So this is the cherry display that I built. And I haven't talked about the tunnel. I said I got a tunnel down there, but I haven't talked about it too much. And what it is, is this is supposed to be a tunnel for German soldiers that have dug below all that's going on above. So I think the, I, I, I calculated it out. I'm about 35 feet down in scale, 35, maybe 40 feet down in scale in the diorama. So the British and Anzacs have gone down about 35 feet. Well, this is a good nine feet below that. So these guys are probably 45, 50 feet down uh, with their tunnel. And so that's what this is. And it actually appears in uh, the display stand, the cherry display stand that I built over uh, my vacation in December. And um, it goes back and it turns. And I'm really excited about that because... I want to see if I can cast a shadow from around that corner. Now, I don't know if I can, but I always like, I mean, looking down this little, I mean, you tell me I, I'm older, but this reminds me of a scene in Star Trek, which is like one of the things that I just love because there was a lot of, you know, underground stuff in Star Trek and some of the stuff when they go down to a planet. And that, this little thing right here in the diorama looks to me totally like a Star Trek hallway. And I just remember they would do this thing, you know, with the shadow 
as a kid, I remember this, where you're looking down a hallway that curves and then you see this very ominous shadow coming around. You don't know what it is. Well, I've placed lights in that hallway so that I can try to do that. So yeah, I got my fingers crossed. I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm super excited to try. So I just, I just geek out on this stuff and I thought it'd be really fun. So to do that, what I did was, so this is the, the uh, cherry display stand. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to show you that whole left-hand side. You see that opening there? That is where I put this, this thing just literally slides in it. It fills the entire thing. And that is that tunnel that you see uh, through here in the front of the display. And so it's lit right now. The, the shade of those lights are a little bluish and I might change that a little bit. Um, but I do, I, I do like it um, just because it's not, um, it's not the same color. You know, the lighting is not the same color as the other stuff. So I, I think that's kind of cool. Um, let me see. This is just a, another picture. So this uh, is the German officer that is going to be down there. And if you notice his hand, what he's trying to, well, the original figure had a whistle, right? And he's blowing a whistle. Um, that was something they did, right? That's how they moved troops and, you know, said, hey, let's go, whatever. Um, but I didn't want him to do that. I wanted him to do the shush. You know, I wanted to do that. So I, I uh, got in real tight here and I cut off his finger and the little whistle that was in there, I stretched a little sprue and then I put this finger on there and uh, I got a little bit of flack online for that. I thought it was funny, but it is his index finger, I promise you. Um, and I just did it long so that I could, you know, once it's in there, I could come back and trim it down. And uh, I think it came out great. I, uh, I made the finger... And it's a little off angle, but I think it's okay. Uh, he's holding a pistol in his other hand. And I love the fact that he's got a mustache. Um, I think that's going to look really fun. And he's going to be leading these two guys. And, and this guy looks like, you know, he's like, what, 16 years old. Unfortunately, uh, some of the World War soldiers were very young. But this guy looks totally baby face. Uh, and then this is the other guy that looks a little bit more hardened. He's going to be the third guy in line. Now I've got another figure and um, that figure is the one I think I'm going to try to put around the corner where there's like this ominous shadow. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying that. Um, and I like adding these other elements. And, and that's something that I, I, I talk about a lot. Um, you know, I had no idea that I was going to put that there. John Robeck, who's on the call today, he and I had spoken about this little thing, and I and, and I think I mentioned that last week, um, about having it in a different place. And it's just something that I shared with John because we're on Patreon and stuff like that. And um, when I finally put it down there, because I was trying to solve a big problem that I was having with getting that display stand, totally worked out, and I was really happy about it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just fun. Added a lot of work, and I'm really trying to finish this thing. Um not that I'm under any time constraint, but I, I would like to finish it because I'm getting ideas for other stuff, you know, and, and I, I, I should tell you, I've got another project that I'm going to show you here coming up. So I got a picture. So that's that guy. And then this is the picture. So I said earlier uh, that I was going to, uh, I volunteered to repair something. Well, this is it. So this is the Mir, uh, the Russian Mir space station as it was docked with the space shuttle Atlantis. Unfortunately, the model has been, you know, you can see it's, it's, it's got some problems, but uh, the, the museum of flight asked me if I would, uh, if I would repair it. And I, I absolutely thank you. It's an honor. And so, yeah, I, I picked that up this week and it was really fun to, to see it. Um, and what this is, is this is a presentation model for um, astronaut Frank Culbertson. And, um, Really neat. Uh, I read like the short biography on him and stuff. I've got to do about a month worth of research before I even start this thing. Um, I want to be very careful. It's not, I don't do anything to change it. I'm just repairing it. Putting it back together is, is all I'm doing. Um, and so it can be on display. And um, uh, he, uh, astronaut Culbertson, was on the team that did, he was the project leader for the, the actual docking of the shuttle to the mirror. 
Now, I, I got to get my facts straight, but that's what I've read so far. He was also the only U.S. Uh, astronaut. Uh, actually, it's, he was the only U.S. citizen not on uh, planet Earth uh, during 9-11. He was up at Mir. So that, that's, uh, ooh, boy, that was uh, something. So he was the only person that got to see that from space from the United States. Uh, so lots of, lots of history there, lots of stuff to, to think about, lots of, of, of stuff to kind of consume before I start on it. Um, simply putting it back together. Sure. That's fine. But I, the, the, I, I believe that things hold a reverence. I, I think, you know, when I'm doing a diorama, I'm putting stuff into this thing that, that, that are well beyond the sum of its parts. And so I, I like that, uh, every project I work on, uh, whether it's my own or someone else's, I want to know it as, as much as I, I can. And so, and that's very exciting to me. That is a, that is a very, uh, enjoyable part of, of what I do. So real quick, I want to make sure I got all these comments because I've got some comments here that I haven't taken care of. And I apologize for that very much. So, okay. So I have Cole saying, uh, just learned that this YouTuber I used to watch died from complications from alcoholism at 27. Oh my goodness. Uh, that's not great at all. I'm very sorry to hear that, Cole. Um, yeah, gotta you gotta watch that stuff. Uh, I am quite a bit beyond that, and uh, I think I've got all that stuff kind of hammered out. Uh, Neil says, "Have you tried 3D printing a figure yet?" Yes, I have. And when I do um, my skeleton, there I got to put a skeleton in here. Come on, um, those are all 3D printed. I've got a 3D printer and, and done that. I'm not a huge 3D printer fan. It's very messy, and it's probably because I've maybe got older technology. I mean, I've got really nice, it, it, it prints wonderfully. Uh, it's a liquid kind, but um, I don't like doing it. It's messy. It smells. It's just, mm, and I love scratch building. So, so far, I haven't gone that route, and I'm really not interested in, 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 going back and relearning a new CAD, I, you know, I worked in the CAD industry for 25 years. Um, I don't really want to do that anymore. It's not that I can't, meh, I could, but I'm really interested in the hand building stuff. And I love that. But like you say, uh, I, I don't have them here, but maybe I do. Um, when I do skeletons, they've got to be uh, 3D printed because they're just so tiny, 135th scale skeletons. Hey, Barbarossa Models is here. Hello, and thank you very much. Those adapted figures are looking great. Loved uh, what you did with the heads of these guys on your Facebook post. Sculpting the tops of the heads and hair was excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, Simon does uh, amazing stuff. I don't know if you have seen Barbarossa Models. I, I imagine most of you have because his stuff is amazing. And uh, Barbarossa is, is one of my... Um, like the people, men, not mentor because we haven't done stuff together, though we have talked quite a bit, but one of the people that inspired me just to do any of this. Um, lots of thought. Uh, you know, that part where I say, I've, I've said this about Martin Drayton too, the part where I say you look at something and it really makes you think, that's what um, uh, Simon's um, uh, dioramas do. They make you think. And they make you think more about it than you would just looking at it. You're like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. You know, you you think of, oh, I recollect neck tank or whatever. No, you're thinking about the scenery that he puts together. And I think that's wonderful. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it, Simon. Martin says, do you follow Scale Scriber Beal? Uh, you know what? Yes. <clears throat> I, excuse me. I think I saw when Scale Scriber was doing the shuttle. I think last year Scale Scriber was doing a massive shuttle all scale uh ascribed and stuff like that i i don't know if i follow them but i've seen them. neat neat stuff great stuff very very good detail uh scale, john chung i think he's doing a shuttle yeah exactly that's exactly what i've seen that's very cool paul says uh john chung's works is amazing his current f16 is he i have not seen that one i do remember the shuttle but i need to go back and take a look very cool stuff and folks please bring up folks and if you're a modeler and it i, I think it's fine you can put your links in the the comments so other people can get them too i would love people to see your stuff so please go ahead and do that um and john says wow that would be a lot of scribing yeah no kidding what do you think about it when we got close to the shuttle, remember in the 80s, and we got to take a look at it, there was all those tiles. And when I saw the stuff last year, 
on scale scribers think every single one of them, not just the scribing, but I think all the information on the tiles. Oh my goodness. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Great detail. And that's the kind of detail I really like. I think it's that kind of detail that is fascinating because a lot of people can't do it and, uh, or, or maybe they don't have the patience for it or something, but um, I, I think it's really great when, when folks can do it. Thanks very much, everybody. Well, okay, let me see. Where are we at? Um, I'm going to go back to this. And then I think we're just about there. Um, yeah, Model Mania. I wanted to come back to Model Mania. Oh, uh, so remember, uh, Model Mania, February uh, 17th and 18th, 2024. It's 10 to 5 each day. Uh, I think maybe it breaks down about 4 o'clock on Sunday. But it's really great show, folks. It is just... It's super wonderful. I mean, it's just great. You got to go. Um, I've got some videos of past, you know, ones uh, on the channel. So if you want to go take a look and, and see what you think, it's great because there's just so many people, so many models. Um, the other cool thing that's really like this, they allow us to have a table. So we're there and we're building and talking to folks about building. And that's a pretty neat thing to be able to talk to some of the people that, that have their models there and then just walk right over and say, Hey, how, how'd you think about this? Lots of times when I've been there building folks want to go talk to me about something that I've built and I can just get up and go over there and talk to them about it. And it's really fun. Um, I really think you would have a, a great time if you had the chance to go. It's one of the premier model shows that you'll ever go to. Um, and I think that uh, uh, you probably come away and, and, and want to participate the next year. Cause that's the other thing is we're recruiting heavily. We want folks to really get back into modeling. Modeling is so fun. And for me, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, I've talked pretty much pretty openly about this quite a bit. You know, I'm getting a little older. I got knee and back issues, you know, um, I can't do one of the things that I used to do a lot, which is woodworking. I just physically can't do it anymore but I can do modeling and I'm bringing those skills in. So if you're someone that's, that's this is kind of interesting, but you haven't really done a diorama yet, or you haven't done modeling since you're a kid. I think it's a great way to reintroduce yourself to it. Go to a show. A lot of times when there's local meetings, they're open. People can come to them, go to a meeting, look up and see if there's a local show or meeting or club in your area and, and just go participate. Just, just see what you think. You don't have to commit money. You don't got to go out and buy a whole, everybody says the stash of models. You know, we all have a few models. You, you don't have to go off the deep end. Go out and see if it intrigues you. And this is a great show to do that because it's planes, cars, sci-fi, dioramas, space, you name it. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful show. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to continue hyping this thing. So don't think that's going away because, um, it, it's just a neat thing. And it's a great way to see if possibly you wouldn't mind getting, you know, back into it. And I would also like to offer if you are thinking about getting into models and you're not sure about something like that, talk to somebody, I'll talk to you, talk to anybody that you see here. That's, that's, you know, modelers and stuff like that. Um, a lot of us got back into it as we got a little bit older. And so that there was a transitional point, uh, maybe from another hobby, maybe from work, your retirement, whatever the case may be. And you're like, well, what's it like to transition to that? You know, after doing all of this, whatever that was, to modeling, which can be kind of sedentary. Um, mine's not because I do a lot of different stuff and I'm not that kind of person, but it can be. And if that's good for you, then great. It's a wonderful hobby. Um, extremely creative. Um, I think that some of the ideas about modeling in the past might have been you're just taking stuff and putting them together and painting them. It's just not what happens today. You're telling stories. Um, there's a lot of things to do in a model with a diorama. The creativity that it allows you to create little worlds, little stories, uh, little vignettes of uh, ideas that you maybe had that you couldn't express in any other way, you can do it in dioramas. So I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, hobby to transition to or get into or reacquaint yourself with. Um, I got a, uh, another 
comment here. Set your space with Susan says, oddly enough, I just found you after taking my mom about the old mall I remember back in the 80s that had full dioramas and old department stores after the mall closed down. Wow, wouldn't that be cool to go through a, a, a closed down mall and just have like all these dioramas? Uh, that's really cool. And thank you very much for coming on board uh, and, and, and checking us out. You know, I think that's one of the things that's that's neat about dioramas. Um, you're you're telling a story or you're viewing a story that somebody else is telling you about. Um, there's there's something happening there. Um, I used to love those little cartoons when we were kids uh, in the doctor's offices, you know, find this or find that um, or what's different. You know, you have the two images that are just slightly off. I think that little thing was fun. You know, you're looking for something. Well, in dioramas, you can kind of do that too because I'm putting things in here and lots of diorama artists are doing that. They're putting things in there that are personal or or um, they help tell the story at a deeper way than just some other means of communicating an idea. I think that when I'm building a diorama, I'm building a scene like in a movie or a TV show or something like that. I get a lot of my inspiration from TV and movies and, and things like that. So think about that. If you want to be creative, dioramas might be the way to go. Uh, and Scott says, oh, I know about knee and back problems. I hear you. Yes, we've talked, Scott. Uh, this is as close as I can get to a model club. Living in the woods, there's not a lot of young people. Uh, there's not a lot of people. Uh, Y'all great. And I appreciate all of you. That's wonderful, Scott. And thank you. And, you know, Scott is wonderful because he he talks to me just about every day. We, we text back and forth. And that is nice because you can kind of get some of that connection back. You know, you can find something. And, and I'm not just talking about modeling. I'm talking about finding something online that is something that you're interested in and then finding a community that's attached to that. And then you can attach yourself to that community. You can, you can be part of it. If, if you have mobility problems as you're getting older, like some of us do, um, you know, I'm fine. I, I, I can get up and move around, but there are times when it's really difficult and <clears throat> pardon me. It, it makes a lot of sense to be able to talk about and discuss and enjoy others work in a field that you admire. You have some experience in. you've worked in, you can talk about those things. I think that the online community in that regard has really, really matured, and and it's something that I'm a little bit newer to. I, I'd never done the online chats and this and that kind of stuff previously to this. Once I really cemented, hey, dioramas are my thing, and then I started finding a group of people that really enjoyed dioramas, then the community kind of sprung up around that. So um, if this isn't your gig, you can find another one. If this is, welcome. And I think it's a lot of fun. I personally try to post every single day. Uh, so you're going to get my updates every day. And then, of course, we do this weekly live stream. And then the thing that I'm worst at, which I'm really trying to get better at, is my long form videos. I am filming and I am uh, editing long form videos. And, and those will come out too. So there's a whole bunch of data to look at. There's a whole bunch of interest here uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing. And uh, welcome, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm happy you're here. Well, folks, if there's nothing else, I think we're getting close. I do want to say uh, uh, a little bit about my patrons. I love my patrons. They are helping me do this. And there's another way to, to kind of contribute. So here is my patron site. Uh, Patrons, uh, John, Evan, Daniel, Scott, Stephen, Neil, Mark, Josh, and, and Ryan. Uh, and now YouTube members. That's a new thing. So you can actually be a member on YouTube. I haven't completely filled out all of the things that I want to give to the folks on YouTube that's special than, than regular folks. And then the other issue there is I don't really sometimes publish my things long enough so you can get an advantage of having a membership to YouTube so you can get something early because I'm not really publishing early. Sometimes I publish five seconds before it's due. So that's on me. Um, but I do want to give you some extra stuff. I do want that to mean something to be a YouTube member. So I'm working on that and, and, and that will happen uh, here soon. 
Um, but these are the wonderful people that have, have helped me uh, to, to bring you the content that I bring you. They, they help literally pay financially for me doing this. And so if you're interested in any of that, I would really appreciate it. Um, and I also have programs where we can work one-on-one. -on -one. So I figured I'd just throw that in there too. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, ask them now because we're just about to get out of here. Um, but I hope you have a wonderful Friday. Um, one of the advantages of the Patreon account that I have is we do a weekly group build on Friday nights and there's different levels of that. So sometimes it's once a month, sometimes it's just on Fridays. Um, but the one level it's every Friday and we do a group build. It's from 6 PM to 9 PM. And we're looking at those hours so we can include more people, but it's really fun. We get together. You're online too, not just me yammering away, but you're online and we can talk and you can talk with other people that are in that group build too. And it sure is a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy it. Most of the time it's just me and uh, John, uh, John Robeck. But uh, between the two of us, we've basically solved the world's problems, haven't we, John? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have. So um, if you're interested, go take a look at my Patreon. There's links, and uh, it, would it would be really fun to have you there. So I'm going to go ahead and look at our last comments, and uh, I'm so glad that you guys came on board. Um, if you're looking at this and you want to see it from the beginning, I will do the replay, the replay there's a couple of replays. There's a live replay. It's, it's almost immediate. And then there's another replay that I do at four o'clock. That's it's pretty much the same thing, but it's just how I have to post it. So uh, thank you so much, Bill. Um, set your space uh, with Susan says, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate you coming on board. Paul, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on board. Um, John, thanks for coming in, sir. It's great to see you. Hope you can make it tonight. Really looking forward to it. Um, John, problems all solved. Yep. Perfect. That's fantastic, sir. And then Mark, thanks, Bill. I'll try to write over the weekend. Wonderful. Again, no pressure. I'm not probably going to get back to it any sooner, uh, but I really do appreciate hearing from you, sir. And Scott, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming in. It was great to see you. And I hope you're feeling a little bit better. Um, and and Oscar, I'm, I'm doing good. I'll, I've got antibiotics and we're okay. And he is still snoozing. So he's doing great. Have a great weekend, everybody. I hope you get us a little bit of time at the bench. Uh, get creative, do something new. If you haven't, uh, it's a lot of fun. So we'll see you and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.